Cool. So thank you for uh, spending time with me today and uh, having this conversation. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, so let's let's start talking about uh, John Owen. Uh, he was a Puritan. Sixteen uh, hundreds, right? Yeah, sixteen sixteen to sixteen eighty three. Okay, and why is he important for Christians? Uh, I think he's important to Christians for a lot of different reasons, but. One, his scholarly mind and uh, the contributions that he can make to theology. I mean, if you look at historically, those who have been on the losing side tend not to be remembered or written well, and they don't they get the bad press. And I think that's you know being a Puritan and in, in, in some ways on the losing side of history, Owen's been largely forgotten kind of out of the theological conversation and I think people are rediscovering him now um, because he has such a, an analytical mind this ability to to hold within his mind just the whole uh, western eastern t tradition of theology this trinitarian scripturally rooted theology that's in conversation with the early church fathers and in conversation with folks like Aquinas so I think his, his brilliance has been unrecognized and is just starting to be rediscovered in a way. There's a bit of a resurgence of interest in Owen. Um, but you combine that with his love for the church and his his very evident love for God and his desire to glorify God in everything, to try to root everything in scripture. Um, it's just an unusual combination. And when you find somebody like that, um, He's just a person worth exploring, somebody who can challenge our own thinking, um, and I think provide some guidance for us today. So he, he, he's writing in the context of the Reformation then. Right. Uh, what sort of things from then apply to us today? Well, the first book that Kelly Capick and I worked on, um, kind of reintroducing Owen's corpus, you know, we don't plan, people ask, so you plan to keep going through all the lines, which, which we don't. Um, was on sin and temptation. And so, I mean, that's never going to go out of style. Right. Sin and the need for holiness and strategies for fighting for God and against sin. Um, and I think, you know, among lay people especially, that's his, if his work's known at all, it's his work on sin and temptation. Um, I mean, I love some of these lines from, from J.I. Packer that he's quoted of other people saying, it's not that you're reading Owen, it's that Owen's reading you. Because Owen was not only a student of you know, the political environment of his day, not only a student of scripture, but I think he's a student of human nature. And so once you get past some of the archaic language and um, that sort of setting, you discover that he's talking about the human heart, which I mean, lots of things change, but the human heart essentially remains the same. So that's a place, I think, where he just has tremendous relevance for all of us. Um, another area I'd point to, ironically, relates to the second book we worked uh, on, which was, convenient. yeah, <laughs> it's a little coincidence there, but uh, Communion with the Triune God is what we called our book. Um, Communion with God in Three Persons. And I think, you know, Carl Truman, who is uh, at Westminster Church historian, good Owen scholar, has talked more broadly about Trinitarianism and says that functionally the Western Evangelical Church tends to be Unitarian in practice. In other words, we don't act as if the Trinity is true. Um, or, and again to quote Packer, talking to him recently, he, he said, you know, some people are so focused on the Father, some people are only focused on Jesus, it's almost jesus anity or spirit anity. I mean, we don't really have a robust Trinitarian view of God. In our worship, it's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and we, they are one Godhead, but we relate to them distinctly. They have distinct roles within the Godhead. Um, I think most of us just haven't thought about that. Uh, paraphrasing Truman, he says, that, you know, for many of us, the Trinity is almost more of a mathematical riddle rather than something that really impacts how we worship and how we evangelize and how we seek to glorify God and everything we do. So those would be two areas at least I think. But if you if you look at sort of 
influence that Owen has had upon Packer. I read recently where Packer talked about his view of spiritual gifts was decisively shaped by Owen. Um, and he was in a sort of perfectionistic uh, Keswick stream before he read Owen. So his view of anthropology and sin and uh, the battle for holiness was decisively shaped by Owen. Um, you know, church structure, I mean, Holy Spirit, um, Owen wrote a massive book on the Spirit, all of those sort of things, I mean, Owen has a lot of relevance. You have to work hard to get to them. It doesn't make it easy for you, it doesn't put it on the bottom shelf, but uh, if you can plod through it, I think Owen has a lot of relevance. It, you mentioned the archaic language earlier, yeah. um, and I know that's something you've tried to uh, adapt in your volumes, uh, is the language. For someone who's coming fresh to Owen, uh, how can they bridge that? I mean, you're, since you're not writing, uh, rewriting all of this stuff. Right. Yeah, it's funny because some people understandably, I think actually probably most people think that the sort of thing that Kelly Capic and I did was uh, either an abridged version of Owen or a prayer phrase, which we really didn't do either. We tried to keep, we tried to let Owen speak but change the things that um, were just really incidental things. So, um, thou and thee and hath and that sort of, you know, the archaic forms of words we change. But for the most part, we let him speak as is, and then we try to put footnotes and a real extensive glossary at the end. So that was one thing we tried to do, and then another thing was to do a real extensive outline. I mean, if you outline it was maddening, actually, outlining Owen's points. Very helpfully, he he puts outlining marks, but, you know, it's in the Banner of Truth edition, it's all left justified along the side. So it'd be like having this massive outline, but then just putting everything at the same level. But if you actually do it out, I mean, he might have a main point, a sub point, and then a sub, 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 sub. I mean, you just go all the way down. And um, so I think those sort of things, understanding the structure, yeah. And having some help where you're reading along and you can glance at the bottom and see, oh, that's what this word means, rather than just being baffled or uh, translating some of the Latin and the Greek and the Hebrew and that sort of thing. But um, I think Owen can be read on two levels. Most importantly, you'd want to understand the whole argument of what he's saying. But if you look in the Sin and Temptation volume, there are, there are certain passages, I think, certain paragraphs that in and of themselves can be life-changing. And so I think somebody who really wanted to dive into Owen um, probably do kind of a twofold way of doing it. One is just keep plowing ahead and you're going to just get richness and gold um, just by working through it, even if you don't understand um, a, a number of things. But then there's another level at which you want to slow down and go more slowly. I don't want to compare reading Owen to reading the Bible, but I mean there's similarities too. If you you want to get the big picture, but you also there's times when you want to go deeper, and and I think Owen can be read on more than one level. So you, you did the two volumes. Yeah. Uh, you also have JohnOwen.org. Uh, right. Is that being kept up to date or? What's the status on that? Yeah, if there's anybody out there who uh, wants to help me maintain that <laughs> website, I really started it because even just five years ago, there's very there's enough. There, let me put it this way: there's so little written about Owen, relatively speaking, that on that website I could catalog every single thing I could find that's been written on Owen mm -hmm. and make it. Um, you know, it's almost impossible to have a perfect bibliography, but it was about as comprehensive as it could be. But then in the year 2007, you had four books written on Owen, which if you just look at what's been written on beforehand, I mean, that was kind of a banner year. Yeah. Kelly Capic and Alan Spence and um, Brian Kay and Carl Truman all had books come out that year. So, and I just got back from a conference in England that was on um, John Owen. So I think there's just going to be you know, more and more people doing PhDs on him, and it's going to be harder to maintain that website. Yeah. Well, I want to just get it up there to give people at least a starting place. So it's you know, got a timeline, and uh, it's a short FAQ section, and 
uh, trying to do a bibliography where at least they can see a lot of the major stuff that's been written so far.